0902 hours. Agreed, 808869. Tanks moving westward, I'm observing, over. One more job. How many tanks? Over. One to Alpha, 10 or 12, maybe more. The mist is very thick, I can hear a lot of noise, I'm awaiting sight of them, over. One more job, out. 332 Charlie, contact 904. Grid 906912. 10 tanks in soil, followed by four APCs, advancing across fields and observing. Wait out. Well, this is 14 Bravo. Contact 0905. Tanks advancing west northwest from woods. I'm observing. Wait out. Hello, one. This is 13 Alpha. A 15 tanks at track junction, a grid 807873. <laughs> In September 1980, British forces mounted the biggest military operation seen in Europe since the Normandy landings. They called it Exercise Crusader. The main part of the exercise alone involved 92,000 men and 35,000 vehicles and lasted two weeks. Central to the whole operation was the ability to shift 30,000 regular soldiers and territorial volunteers from Britain to Germany in a single weekend. It's a funny thing. You look at this lot and they look the same as the next. But yesterday they were driving buses, being solicitors, you name it. So, NATO, that if there was a war, we could reinforce the British army on the Rhine very, very quickly. That doesn't just mean getting them there, it means deploying them in the field as well. Now, that's a major commitment. And what Crusader has proved to our NATO allies, I think, is that we can do just that. And in the context of an exercise, we can do it without serious disruption of civilian life. Getting everybody to the right place at the right time will be difficult enough if there were a war about to stay. In peacetime, you've got to do it with minimum inconvenience to the general public. We've had hundreds of convoys, all heading for the exercise area, which is a patch of North Germany, about 45 by 60 k, centred on Hildesheim. The whole thing has been a massive logistics operation, and a very successful one. we had to lay 75,000 dummy mines by like yesterday. Now, that's a lot of mines, and the only reason we could do it is because our bar mine layer system is the most efficient thing of its kind in the world.
Crusader was designed as an exercise with certain assumptions in mind. We assume that a period of political tension leading to hostilities would give us a bit of warning. Not much, but time to get everybody over to Germany and dug in before things start. We next assume that there's no way we could initially withstand the sheer weight of armour that would roll over us. So that in the exercise is what we call a break-in battle. In phase two, which we call Operation Goodwood, the idea is to contain the enemy advance and stop it, ready for phase three, the counterattack. Gunners always have the most digging to do. Goes with a job. But your big guns have got to be well dug in and well camouflaged. Otherwise, they're sitting ducks. Local people have been marvellous. All right, I know they're getting good compensation for it, but we're still digging bloody great holes in their fields and gardens. As for the kids, I reckon half the kids in the village have been helping us dig trenches and get cammed up. Absolutely marvellous, they've been. Okay, we'll be moving in the next couple of hours. We don't want any problems with this evening. Okay. Yep. Yep, 0800-035. The two sides in the exercise were codenamed Blue and Orange. Blue represented NATO forces and were for the most part British. As is the custom, the British had asked two of their NATO allies, in this case the Americans and the Germans, if they would play the part of Orange forces alongside one of the British armoured divisions. In the first place, Blue were defending against a massive thrust by Orange armour with heavy air support.
Tell me as you know. Your tactics have got to be hit and run. You have to do everything you can to neutralize the enemy's overwhelming numerical superiority. So Blue will never go crashing through the fields like a herd of rogue elephants. They're dotted around in ones and twos, killing as many enemies as they can and then getting out. Well, the theory is that you withdraw to your next position where you can get ready to hit them again and you get out before you sustain heavy casualties. Well, it's a matter of timing, really. You have to let them get close enough so that you can kill them, but not so close that they can spot you and kill you. Uh, not everybody gets it right and gets out in time. Yes, of course, there's a big element of artificiality in an exercise like this. I mean, there's bound to be. But there's no live ammunition, and it's all blanks and smoke and fireworks. But, but I reckon it's actually the umpires, the, the, the chaps with the white armbands and the white crosses on their vehicles, who make it a bit closer to the real thing. Because they know exactly what's happening, what artillery is being called up and so on. And it's their job to award casualties, determine how successful each side is. And it's a bit chilling when one of them tells you you've just put your men in the wrong place and they're all dead. They're damn glad it's an exercise, I can tell you. And they can tell very accurately just how a particular manoeuvre has gone. Well, I think it works very well. However, uh, from what you have told me so far, I don't believe that he has any infantry with him. Over. Yeah, I guess you could say it was a pretty interesting paradox for us. We came out of Fort Bragg in North Carolina. That's uh, all our men and a whole lot of equipment. And we flew direct across the Atlantic for our drop. First time that's been done. And we're only six minutes late on target. Yeah, one minute you're back home. Next, your orange force is dropping by on blue lines. It's kind of, kind of disorienting. It's gone very quiet all of a sudden. Everything's gone quiet. Horrible. Ominous. Oh, Jesus. At this stage, Blue broke off all contact with the enemy, withdrew to the next line of defence, and blew up all the bridges behind them. Yeah, obviously, we don't blow the bridge out for real, but uh, we have to wire it, prepare it exactly as if we were going to us. The, uh, the only way the umpires will let us have it. We have changed from state uh, 
ready. Stay calm. Hold up. Day four. Orange was still advancing and Operation Goodwood began. This was the phase where Blue's infantry, many of them territorial units, had the job of containing the advancing Orange armour. The idea was to see whether infantry armed with a range of anti-tank weapons but without armoured support could deal effectively with a major tank thrust. gas attacks and it's not much fun inside those masks I can tell you the battle of fifth day it's because we know. get a lot of it to knocking them out by the score from that second wave all choppers destroyed and 95 percent free company casualties I think a lot of people thought it wouldn't work putting our infantry up against orange like that but it did and by the middle of day five orange had sustained so many losses they were beginning to slow down and then, of course, we knew we'd got him. Right now! Well, this has been as, as near as damn in a rehearsal of what would happen if there was a, a war in Europe. I don't think anyone else has gone as far as we have in, in demonstrating just how capable we are of playing our part in dealing with a threat to the NATO alliance. Slater, get Starlight. Okay, that's three, three, one. So Starlight, my position now, over. Three, one, Roger, out. Don't panic. We'll have you in a minute. Well, you open on an exercise like this, nobody will get hurt. Oh, some do, but you still got to test all your medical procedures, your Kazavag. So there's a lot of casualties made up and put into the battle here and there to test the system. Well, you may come in ones and twos, they may come in big numbers. You don't know in advance. Well, then they get basic treatment in the field before they get back to a field dressing station. Then maybe it's a field hospital or eventually even the base hospital. Right, mate, stick with you, Actually, most of the medical orderlies are bandsmen normally. They're all trained as orderlies as well as being musicians. Uh, if there was a war, that's what they'd do. The great thing about the Harrier, of course, is it doesn't rely on airfields, which are immensely vulnerable to attack. You can hide Harriers close to the battle area, and as long as you've got some lightly wooded country for your hides and a, a natural clearing for a short takeoff, you're, you're in business.
What's more, by being so much closer to the main battle area, you increase significantly the amount of air support you can give. Now, during this exercise, and we have really bad weather conditions, the RAF flew nearly 1,500 sorties, more than half the sorties flown by NATO air forces as a whole. That is a lot of air support. counterattack gets underway, blue armour comes into its own, capturing ground while the infantry mop up resistance in the villages. Gentlemen, the colonel is still talking to the brigadier, but uh, briefly the situation is this. Orange are still holding the bridge at Jainsen, and our latest intelligence is that it's not yet been blown. They are also occupying the village itself in company strength. Now, we'll be going in by Wessex helicopters in a simultaneous assault on bridge and village. The aim is to capture the bridge before it's blown. Now, set your maps up for the Jainsen area. The numbers that you have Where left, the numbers that you have left, they remain down there, or take them down there. Yeah, you will them. all go down there, and you will report to higher information no that this position is, hi is, is, half, is, is sorry, still half taken. Is Charlie. heavily held, but you have inflicted heavy casualties upon them. So we have been. Yes. Yeah. Right, right Briggs, can you move out? Yes, of course, an exercise like this is expensive. And I'm sure there'll be those who'd suggest the money ought to be spent elsewhere. But I think that's missing the point. You only know an army's effective if you've tested it at full stretch and proved it's effective. But if you have to look at that East German border every day as we do, if you see those double walls they put through the border villages, the electrified fences, the guards, the watchtowers. It's a chilling experience. And I think it gives you a completely different perspective on the need for an exercise like this.
They've got dogs on some sections, tied to the wire when they're young, and they spend their whole lives on it. Die there. There are the scatter guns, charming little devices that blast ball bearings into you if you trip them off. And that strip they've carved out, it runs like a great scar from the Baltic to the Austrian border. And it's there just to keep their people in. And if there's a more eloquent comment on the kind of system that needs to do that, I confess I can't think of it. No, you look at that lot every day, and I think it's a constant reminder that we can never, never afford to be caught unprepared.